Welcome to the Barrier Breakdown, Disrupting Mental Health Podcast, where we talk about the clinical and practical issues that face those working in the mental health industry. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for this week's episode of the Barrier Breakdown. My name is Erin Molino Bailey. I'm the Chief Operating Officer at Cognitive Behavior Institute, and my co host, Dr. Kevin Caridad, who is the CEO and owner of Cognitive Behavior Institute. On our episode of this week, we are joined by Dr. Jacob Appel, an Associate Professor of Psychiatry and Medical Education at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai, where he serves as Director of Ethics Education in Psychiatry and Assistant Director of Academy for Medicine in the Humanities. He is currently co-chair of the Group for the Advancement of Psychiatry's Committee on Psychiatry and the Law and Judge for the 2021 National Book Critics Circle Awards. Thank you so much for being here with us, uh, Dr. Appel. We're very excited to have you. And I was wondering if we could start off our conversation uh, for our listeners today, if you could tell us a little bit more regarding medical ethics and how you got involved. Sure, and I really appreciate the introduction. But as I always remind people to my mother, I'm still her son who's not the rabbi. So all is contextual. <laughs> Um, so I had no idea what medical ethics was, let alone thinking of having a career in it, um, when I went to college and I was very interested in the law and legal history and legal ethics. And I took a class with a professor who's now passed away named Edward Beiser, who taught both the courses I was interested in and also medical ethics. So I took the classes I was interested in, uh, then I took the classes he was interested in. Then I went to law school and he hired me to co-teach the classes in which I had some expertise. And then he became critically ill, and I suddenly found myself teaching a medical ethics class as well. And so entirely serendipitous. Um, my first year doing it, I was one week ahead of the students in terms of learning the material. By the end of it, I was about two weeks ahead of the students in learning the material. Now, now I have a 20-year head start on them, so it's hard for them to catch up. Seems like it's all worked out. I was going to say, I'd like to say that, but as, uh, as Oedipus says, um, count no man happy until he is dead. So let's cross <laughs> our fingers for now. That's great. Uh, you know, recently uh, I had a discussion with uh, someone I was networking with and suggested uh, your book, Who Says You're Dead? Uh, and when I read that, uh, there was just, I couldn't, couldn't stop uh, reading it. Uh, all the different aspects. I was a registered nurse prior. So a lot of the medical things that were talked about, particularly with fertility, uh, was was quite interesting. And then uh, most of our listeners here are in the behavioral health sphere. And so some of the things that you discussed then I thought would be very pertinent to, to hear now. And I think to really press people's brains about what to think about within the behavioral health realm and want to see what your what are your thoughts in contemporary times uh, about some of the major ethical issues uh, facing uh, the behavioral health uh, field? Sure. And, and I always preface anytime I talk about ethical issues, by saying I view my role as to raise hard questions. I obviously have my own viewpoints in a number of issues, but my goal is in this setting, certainly not to persuade people to agree with me, but get them to think about the issues. And most importantly, to enable them to have meaningful conversations, to realize the people who disagree with them start off with different premises, so they come to different conclusions, but can still be people of goodwill and, and insight. With that in mind, I think the first issue that has certainly been a significant issue here in the United States of late is the Goldwater Rule, um, which some of your audience members may be familiar with. It is the rule that prevents psychiatrists, per the American Psychiatric Association, of offering diagnoses of individuals that they haven't encountered in person. And this has become extremely controversial during the presidency of Donald Trump, a prominent psychiatrist, Brandy Lee, Bandy Lee, excuse me, at Yale. Um, claimed she was fired from her position at Yale for diagnosing both President Trump and the law professor Alan Dershowitz. But there are larger implications to this rule than simply current American politics, because lay people don't have these sorts of restrictions on their behavior, and psychologists don't have these restrictions on their behavior. So it doesn't just prevent psychiatrists from talking about Donald Trump or Joe Biden. It also keeps from talking about the Aurora, Colorado shooter, or the gentleman in Arizona who shot Congressman Gabrielle Giffords and offering a psychiatric perspective on these cases. So there are significant inadvertent consequences that I think are an unheralded and unspoken about uh, ethical issue, particularly for behavioral health. 
I think there's a whole slew of other issues related to boundaries that we really haven't talked about. Um, I think some boundary issues in psychiatry are fairly clear, like you shouldn't sleep with your patients. But there's a wide range of other questions. Should you help your patients getting gain employment? Should you help your patients gain housing? To what degree does engaging in social service transcend the role of behavioral health providers? And in the third area, I think we have talked far too little about as a society, is what obligations psychiatry, psychiatrists, mental health professionals more broadly have beyond the actual practice of a profession in terms of advocating for a better society, advocating for human rights, and then whether it's uh, reducing discrimination in society or improving the environment, um, there is a model of mental health that says that improving the welfare of society improves the psychi psychiatric or psychological health of all of our patients or clients, and a very different mindset that says your job is to treat the patient in front of you. And I think those are very much still intention in all mental health fields. No, I think those are, those are three great areas. So let's get into the least controversial one, the Goldwater uh, uh, a rule that you had spoken about earlier. Can you talk a little bit about more about some of the concerns you think that's raised by uh, what you've been seeing? Sure. So I think it's important to give a little bit of background on the Goldwater rule for those who are not familiar. So the Goldwater rule arose in the 1970s after during the 1964 presidential election in the United States. Uh, two men, um, Ralph Ginsburg and Warren Borison, um, sent out a survey to members of the American Psychiatric Association asking them whether Barry Goldwater, the Republican candidate, was fit to run for president, or fit to serve as president. And over a thousand APA members not only said he wasn't, but diagnosed him in various unsettling ways, um, calling him schizophrenic, calling him um, psychotic. Uh, now, whatever one thinks of Barry Goldwater, who was a very conservative individual who I, I would not have voted for, there is no evidence that he suffered from a severe mental illness. Um, the American Medical Association, which had hoped he would win, because he also opposed Medicare, Medicaid, federal funding for healthcare, um, put a lot of pressure on the APA to ban psychiatrists from talking about the mental health of people they hadn't evaluated. Um, the problem with that is twofold. One, if we accept this as a standard of care, we allow a professional organization that is not a licensing authority, that has no official role in the field, um, I always like to say the American Psychiatric Association is to my profession what the Knights of Columbus or the Elks or the Rotary Club are to other people's profession. <laughs> They're a gentleman or ladies club that may do some wonderful work, um, but they have no official capacity. And suddenly they're making rules that they impose not just upon their own membership, but upon the field at large. If you can't teach at Yale because you violate their rules, then it becomes a professional code. Not only might that be undesirable relating to specifically the Goldwater rule, but it gives them an opening to make lots of other rules that many of us might be very uncomfortable with. So, so that's one concern. Um, the second concern um, is medicine and psychiatry and mental health care work best when there is a wide latitude to debate the issues. And when we only enforce rules when there's a strong consensus. What you saw during the Trump years I, I do not mean to pass judgment on the president one way or another, or the former president, but I want to emphasize that there were numerous prominent figures in psychiatry who either questioned the Goldwater rule or simply ignored the Goldwater rule. And to a large degree, there was no mechanism for enforcing the rule. Um, and once you have a rule on the books that you enforce sporadically, that does more to undermine faith both in the profession and the APA than anything any individual might say about a particular political figure. No, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, and it seems, uh, I don't know if it was your view, but it seems to add a lot of fuel uh, to the controversies out there and whip up uh, political distress that was already present. Yeah, I mean, I think the best way to depoliticize mental health, which I think is important, is to let mental health professor, professionals do what they want to do in the public sphere and say what they want to say um, as individuals without the imprimatur of the profession. Um, Obviously, if someone says I'm speaking as a psychiatrist or a psychologist, nobody can really stop them from doing that. But it's very different from saying I'm speaking as a member of the APA. And in your book, you had spoken about uh, a clinician that was aware of a politician, a prominent politician who had been diagnosed with a, a mental health disorder, but wasn't disclosed and was prominent. What are your thoughts about that and any concerns? I think that's a much more challenging question. What do you do when you as a provider 
have not just general knowledge of the world, but specific knowledge as a provider that poses that an individual in your care or who is related to someone in your care poses a specific threat to the public. Now, many of your listeners probably know that the Tarasov rules, um, which are a set of rules initially developed in California in the 1970s, tell us that if a patient or client poses a direct threat to an individual through physical violence um, or some other very tangible and imminent threat, you have an obligation in some states to report them and other states actually to warn the potential victim. The question is, if your knowledge relates to a public figure who may endanger us all, does that same obligation apply? How imminent does the danger have to be? You don't want to have a system where you scare prominent individuals who happen to suffer from psychiatric illnesses, often well-treated, from entering the public arena. You can think of a handful of very concrete examples of American political figures who clearly suffered from significant psychiatric illness, who nonetheless achieved great benefit to the American people. The two that come to mind offhand, whether one agrees with their politics or not, were Tom Eagleton, the former senator from Missouri, who initially was uh, George McGovern's running mate in 1972 and was thrown off the ticket for having had shock therapy and went on to several very distinguished terms as a U.S. senator. And then Lawton Childs, the former governor of Florida, um, who had taken an antidepressant when he had uh, heart surgery, and there were questions whether this rendered him unfit to serve. He eventually served two very successful terms um, as governor. So you don't want to scare people out of the public arena. No, I, I, the stigma uh, related to mental health issues is uh, is still present, uh, and I can see how that's very complicated. Uh, and I think that leads into sometimes boundaries. Uh, can you speak to a little bit uh, some of the ethical concerns and questions that come up related to boundaries? and behavioral health. Absolutely. I, I will offer one more thought on stigma, just an example sure. that comes to mind um, that, that both is amusing, but also really disconcerting to show you how stigmatized psychiatric illness has been for politicians historically. Milton Schapp, who I imagine no one in your audience has ever heard of, let alone remembers, was a gubernatorial candidate in Pennsylvania who Walter Annenberg, the owner of the Philadelphia Inquirer, particularly disliked on a personal level. So during Schapp's campaign, Annenberg sent a reporter to a press conference to ask, to ask Milton Schapp whether he'd ever been hospitalized for mental health reasons. Um, so Schapp had no mental health history at all. He looked utterly dumbfounded when asked this, said absolutely not. And the front page headline on the Inquirer ran, Schapping eyes having been hospitalized for mental illness. So that gives you a sense of how dangerous this can be in the wrong hands. Um, it's a weapon. Want, <laughs> it's a weapon. It's a weapon, yes. Uh, I think boundary issues are increasingly a concern in psychiatry, especially as we now live in a world where people are doing sessions from Zoom from their home, um, where people are practicing in multiple jurisdictions. Um, my, my old joke is um, that if you're an analyst and you actually only listen and rarely speak to your patients, you can just line up a series of laptops all focused on you and do therapy with a dozen people at the same time. Um, that would not be ethical, but it is the world we are slowly entering. I mentioned that because I think once you invite people into your homes, even metaphorically, certain barriers break down, it becomes easier to transfer from a boundary crossing, to use the language of psychiatrist Glenn Gabbard, into a boundary violation. So a couple of specific areas that I think raise complex ethical issues are one, while we all can agree that you should not have romantic or sexual relationships with your current patients. And the American Psychiatric Association, though not necessarily all other professional organizations of mental health have said you can't have relationships with your former patients. Complex issues have arisen around relatives of your patients or friends of your patients. Um, for example, Ohio has sanctioned a physician for having a relationship with a parent of one of the patients he was treating. Um, if you live in New York City, using your office as a pickup lounge is clearly very disturbing. If you live in Nome, Alaska, and everyone is related to someone who you're treating in one capacity or another, eventually, the expansion of these rules becomes concerning. And Mississippi grappled with the outer boundaries of it. They had considered a law, um, it did not pass, but it will be considered again, that would have banned romantic relationships with a provider's patients, former patients, relatives of patients, or relatives of former patients, whether or not you were aware of their circumstances. You could understand why that would be problematic in certain ways. Could you imagine uh, the family tree you'd be asked to present on the first date just to make sure? I mean, seriously, I mean, so I mean, it's clearly a well-intentioned rule. Um, but I think the problem is a lot of these rules don't have room for an affirmative defense. 
social workers in their code on sexual misconduct um, have room for an affirmative defense, where if you can explain, for example, that you didn't know that this was a relative of a patient, you're off the hook. And psychiatry has not carved out those sorts of exceptions, which I think, whether it's a good idea or a bad idea, raises complex questions. Um, I think the traditional model of not sharing private information with your patients has largely broken down because my patients can find it anything they want about me online. Um, and in the same way, the notion that what the patient shares with you in the office is mostly, if not all, what you learn about them is also broken down because I can look up the patients online um, and find out a lot about them. If I'm doing private therapy, I wouldn't want to do that without the patient's permission. In the emergency room where I work, it raises much more complex questions, uh, not just in terms of gathering information, but in terms of revealing information. So something some of your providers may not have thought about. There have been numerous leaks now of search terms where people have searched for information and a whole block of searches has been released attached to a particular URL. So I sit in the Mount Sinai emergency room and I type in Jacob Appel diagnosed with severe psychiatric, into the, psychiatric illness into the computer. And then there's a leak. And suddenly six years from now, somebody can search the internet and they will see my name attached to diagnosed with severe psychiatric illness attached to Mount Sinai emergency room. That should give us all pause. Um, so exactly how much information you could inadvertently release while trying to gather information is a really challenging ethical dilemma. No, one uh, recent uh, development as far as potential for boundary issues is is OpenNote. Are you familiar with OpenNote uh, and the implementation uh, of that uh, starting in April? Um, I don't know the specific Open OpenNote is going to be one of these like public access programs for notes. Uh, the name of the bill is I'm pulling it up here as we talk. Is let me see here. Uh, it's called the Cures Act rule. The Cures Act, yeah. So it's open note. I mean, open note must be one of the various programs that have an misspoke. Yeah, correct. Yeah. So yes, so the Cures Act, um, to my understanding, has not yet been applied to behavioral health um, by the regulators, but I imagine it will be at some point. Um, but you already can pick up lots of behavioral health information simply by looking at someone's non-behavioral health record. You can see what medications they're on. Um, the general provider will quote the psychiatric notes. So it is a challenge. Um, and I think the issues it raises are twofold. One, not whether people have a right to access their medical records, because clearly I think this is a consensus they do, but in what context, in what time frame they do. Should they be able to do this on their own in their privacy of their homes? Should their first exposure be with a provider at their side? Um, and one can apply this not just in the behavioral health context, but in any context. You have a right to know what your prognosis is for your cancer, but you're far better off learning it when the provider sits down and tells you than learning it from a computer chart when you're on the public bus. Um, so I think that's going to raise a lot of complex issues. And then there's the issue of uh, providers speaking in code in the chart. So the one I, the example I always use is because malingering, um, feigning psychiatric illness is not billable um, to many insurers or certainly to Medicare or Medicaid. And its symptoms almost uniformly overlap with adjustment disorder with disturbance of conduct that has become code for malingering in many hospitals. Um, many people providing psychiatric care in the private setting for very well-adjusted people will diagnose them with a personality disorder not otherwise specified to technically meet the requirements for illness. Um, and then lots of people will go home befuddled thinking suddenly they have an unspecified personality disorder, which they clearly don't. Yeah, yeah, very confusing. And I also wonder, you know, this, uh, there's a, a natural push for integration of behavioral health and physical health due to like the impact study and, and the improvements there. But you mentioned earlier about, you know, the sharing of medication records where you could see someone's being treated for behavioral health. Are there any concerns as, uh, as technology, apps, uh, and, and medical all kind of coming to a head? And then how do you split? How do you share what's helpful? What's not helpful? How do you determine that? I mean, the big problem is the interoperability of the system. So you will hear people who think that having a system in which any healthcare provider can access any medical record is a good thing. Um, and there are upsides to it. So if I show up in an emergency room and I'm acutely psychotic and can't tell you my medical history or even how to get collateral information, you can look up information either through my name or through some biomarker from any hospital I've been to in the United States. That's the ultimate goal. Um, and there's a lot of benefit that VA has a system, for example, where you can do something fairly similar. The downside is if I'm a pharmacist in Alaska 
and my daughter is getting married in Florida, and I'd like to know a little bit about her fiance's health record, I can plug his name into the system and find that information. And even if you have safeguards, like a break the glass system or some kind of access restriction, um, once the genie's out of the bottle, once I know that he has a drug problem or psychiatric history um, or a criminal record or whatever it is, we can't put that genie back in the bottle and his recourse is limited. He can certainly report his future father-in-law and have me lose my license. That really doesn't do him much good. So I always remind people when prominent public figures are hospitalized, um, Bill Clinton comes to mind, Farrah Fawcett comes to mind, Columbia Presbyterian, Cedar sinai actually sent out warnings to staff saying, in essence, there's a famous person in our hospital. If you look up their medical record, you will be fired. And large numbers of people still did it. And a bunch of them were fired. So if people do that with celebrities, think how low the bar is for looking up your record or mine. And there's no one tracking it. And that's a huge problem. I remember when that happened with Britney Spears. And that was in when she had her, uh, her, her episode of behavioral health. Uh, several years ago, I remember seeing a story about how there were people who were were fired, you know, for for searching those those medical records. So, um, that's that's a, a good reminder to human everyone. nature. Yeah, human nature. And I can magnify it one step further. If I were, I don't know, a eighteen year old hacker um, sitting in my computer in Moscow or Shanghai, and I wanted to have some fun and had a lot of knowledge, I could hack into the American medical record and publish large quantities of it online with impunity. Or more concerning, if I were a foreign state actor or a terrorist, I could do the same. And you could imagine the devastating effects of having the American medical record in entirety available to search on the internet. Also, it could be a national security issue of blackmail. Absolutely. Um, sure. I mean, we, we don't know for very good reason certain aspects of the mental and physical health of our leaders. Um, and we don't want foreign intelligence services to know them either. Good point. Uh, you know, I think uh, transitioning to your kind of your third point of considerations going beyond typical practice for uh, behavioral health clinicians, you know, what concerns or thoughts uh, do you have? Sure. So, and I, I always emphasize, I, I have my own personal vested interest and I could talk about a couple of things that I am particularly interested in, but, but sure. I think the, the larger Please. question um, is what, what obligations and responsibilities do we place on professionals in medicine? So many people are familiar with the Hippocratic Oath. They're familiar with uh, the various modern versions, the Oath of Maimonides. I always emphasize the original Hippocratic Oath is clearly a guild rule. Um, among its prominent rules are don't teach anybody other than the sons of doctors how to practice medicine and don't practice surgery implicitly because surgeons will also interfere with our turf. But now we view the modern versions as ethics rules. The Soviet Medical Oath had a specific provision saying it was the duty of physicians to try to prevent nuclear war. You could ask yourself, if you don't try to do that, are you not acting ethically as a provider? And the same applies here. So there are some very concrete areas that relate to practicing medicine that we need to think about, and then broader policies beyond medicine. So there's a question of whether doctors should be involved in certain controversial procedures, the force feeding of prisoners, enhanced interrogation techniques, capital punishment, various professional organizations have taken various stances. But then what obligation do doctors have to fight for human rights around the world, to fight against racism and discrimination in the United States, to fight, about, to fight for mitigation of climate change? Um, and how do they balance their political views versus the need to be a blank slate or receptive to all patients who come into their office? So if, if I have a giant picture of Hillary Clinton or Donald Trump, above my chair in my practice, um, that is sending a very subtle message to any patient who comes in who may not feel comfortable telling me their underlying social needs. Um, how you balance your role as a public figure against your role as a provider offering non-judgmental regard is something that the internet and the modern world are really forcing our profession to grapple with. How are you seeing it currently being grappled with? What are the discussions? So that's a really good question. Um, so on the one hand, in medical schools, in the academy, I think there is a lot of support and even push for young doctors to get involved in various issues that I mentioned. Um, on the other hand, the canons of the profession still argue that one should not tip one's hand, tip one's hand or show one's card, so to speak. Um, I will often have patients come into the emergency room who clearly are there either because they're upset about a particular set of circumstances in the political world or the larger world, 
and they will ask me what my viewpoint is. Uh, and sometimes I will very much agree with their concerns and sometimes I will very much disagree with their concerns. Um, but the challenge is to make them feel empowered or heard without showing them my own views. Um, and it's a very hard thread to needle to thread. And I think that fortunately providers don't get very much training on how to do that. You learn that on the job. It's true. It's not really taught these, uh, these kind of heavy things. And as a, as an owner of a clinical practice, the one thing I spend a lot of time is on ethical issues, uh, which I did not think when I first stepped out and started a solo practice. And now with a group practice of over 50, 60 clinicians that I'd be spending time on that. But it is, a, it is probably where we spend a lot of time and it's most needed. And it's probably the least amount of education given during our graduate work. Yeah, I mean, it's a real challenge that, and I think you're not alone. Lots of providers I talk to um, in private practice, in a hospital setting, they're stunned at how many ethical and issues of the nexus of ethics and law come up in their work that they were never trained to deal with. And as importantly, they weren't even trained where to go to find answers. Um, one of my goals with the medical students, I'm not going to teach them all of psychiatric ethics, but at least to give them some resources when a challenge comes up, both to recognize that it's a problem. Because if you don't recognize it's a problem, then you're really in trouble. And to know where to turn to get help. So where do people turn to get help? Um, so I think there are short-term short -term answers and long-term answers. So sure. I always tell people, if you have an acute problem in a hospital, you always have an ethics committee, you have a legal department, you have a risk management department. And if you have an acute problem and you're in practice, you always have your uh, insurer who always has a lawyer on staff will be glad to talk to you at great, great length about any problem that may implicate them. But in the long term, for more complex problems, most states let you write to their state medical board. Most professional associations have an ethics committee or an ethics panel that will offer you informal guidance or unofficial guidance. Um, and what I always like to emphasize is it's very important to make ethical decisions in a field like psychiatry or mental health by consensus. Um, that no one person has the expertise or the wherewithal to figure out how to solve the world's psychiatric problems, particularly the world's ethical psychiatric problems. But if we triangulate and enough people weigh in, we'll come much closer to a decision that serves the patient. Well, that's uh, really great advice. Uh, I think that's a great way to close out here. I mean, this has been fantastic. This is one of the, my favorite interviews I've been waiting for, and it turned out exactly where I hoped. So thanks. Uh, Thanks for doing this, Dr. Appel. It was absolutely my pleasure. Glad to be with you all. Before you go, I have to ask one more question. Uh, I heard that you are also a New York City sightseeing guide. I was before the pandemic. Um, oh, okay. Yeah. Well, could, you, <laughs> but, could you tell our listeners one of New York City's lesser known attractions? So I will tell them what may be New York's most obscure attraction, but I really admire it anyway. Please. So it's, the, it's the Amiable Child Monument, which is located just south of 125th Street on Riverside Drive, and it is a monument to a small child that fell off the cliff into the Hudson River 200 years ago. And this monument in various forms has been preserved ever since. And what I found one of the most touching moments ever in New York, I, I've lived here for most of my life, was after 9-11, people came to this monument and brought flowers and wishes and St. Christopher's medals and it became sort of a, a shrine away from, from the chaos of downtown. Um, and it, it always touches me because how one small child and the effort to preserve his memory um, has really helped so many people is really something um, I really uh, value greatly. Uh, that, that's a great, that's a great final uh, note there. And I want to recommend everybody uh, to go get the book, Who Says You're Dead? I mean, it was a wonderful book. I couldn't put it down. And uh, Anybody in the medical or health or behavioral health field, I think it's a must must read. I appreciate that. Thank you so much for being with us, Dr. Powell. We really appreciate your time and we hope to stay in touch with you and thank you for all the great work that you do. Thank you very much, my pleasure. Take care. And thank you to our listeners for this week's episode of The Barrier Breakdown. We hope that you all stay safe and healthy. Take care. Thank you for listening to The Barrier Breakdown, Disrupting Mental Health. Listeners can find all of our episodes on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Podbean. For more information and to learn about upcoming continuing education events, check out our website, cbicenterforeducation.com, our Facebook pages, Cognitive Behavior Institute, and CBI Center for Education, 
as well as our Instagram at Cognitive Behavior Institute and our Twitter at CBI underscore Pittsburgh. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. We hope you'll tune in for another guest next week.